get this started. Hi, uh, my name is Maris Kreisman and I'm thrilled to welcome you tonight to another excellent virtual event at McNally Jackson. If you go to McNallyJackson.com and look at our events calendar, you'll see all the amazing writers and programs we're hosting in the coming weeks. Please keep an eye on the site or subscribe to our newsletter to hear more about what's coming soon. There will be time at the end of tonight's conversation for your questions, so start thinking about them now. You can use the Zoom chat function to submit any questions you have, and Jordan will get to them towards the end of the evening. We're so glad that even though we can't all be in the same room at the moment, we're still able to host events during this difficult time. As we've weathered the pandemic and reopened all four of our locations for browsing and shopping, indie bookstores like ours still need more support. And so if you enjoy free events like this one and want us to keep hosting more of them, please buy books from us. Throughout the evening, I'll post links in the chat to buy books from this February edition of Pigeon Pages from McNally Jackson. And I'm so delighted to welcome Jordan Castle, your moderator for tonight, She's the author of the chat book, All His Breakable Things. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in Hobart, HuffPost, New Ohio Review, The New Yorker, and elsewhere. She's an editor at large for Pigeon Pages and a contributor to the LA-based food and culture magazine, Compound Butter. Welcome, Jordan. Thank you so much, Maris, as always. Um, you guys might see or hear my pug in and out. Uh, I will not apologize for that. It's an incredible addition to the evening. And I just wanna thank everybody so much for joining us tonight for our February Pigeon Pages reading. Uh, you could be doing anything right now and I'm very glad that you're here with us. So thank you again to Maris and McNally Jackson for making the Zoom event possible as always. So I'm so thrilled to have Candace, Hannah and Nadia with us tonight to share their work. We will, as Mara said, have a moderated Q&A after everyone has read, at which point you can put those questions in the chat. I'll try and get to as many appropriate questions as I can, given the time we have left. Um, there will be links to buy books. And I wanna echo that, that you know, just as you hopefully would, if you could, if we were in person, I hope you'll consider buying books tonight from McNally Jackson. Um, and a few big, good Pigeon Pages announcements before we get to our readers. Uh, first off, Pigeon Pages is an all-volunteer organization. We're a monthly reading series and an online journal. Donations help make it possible to pay our contributors, fund our contests, and other good stuff like that. So if you're interested in donating to us, you can do so online. And I will even get this link into the chat to make it easy for you. It's a nice bit.ly for you. Um, and speaking of good stuff, our poetry contest, judged by the incredible Natalie Diaz, and this Friday, that's February 19th, we also have a group funding initiative to cover submission fees for Black writers for this contest. So if that applies to you or a writer you know, please reach out to us. You can also go to pigeonpagesnyc.com to learn more about the contest and the Black Writers Fund, or you can DM me on Twitter, DM our wonderful editor-at-large, Hannah Bay, who helped make this possible in the first place. Um, and the poetry contest closes this Friday again, but we are always open for general journal submissions. And lastly, I wanna give a special shout out to Ungbeen Salim, whose gorgeous poem for black and brown people on Shark Tank has been chosen by Tracy K. Smith for inclusion in the Best American Poetry 2021. You can read her poem on our website and you definitely should. It is fantastic. I love this poem and I'm very excited for her. So with that, thank you all again for being with us. Start thinking about your questions as you hear from these amazing readers. Um, over to our first amazing reader of the night, Hannah. Hannah Hirsch holds an MFA in creative writing from NYU, where she served as co-poetry editor of Washington Square Review. She has received support from NYU, the Fine Arts Work Center, the Community of Writers, and the Salton Stahl Foundation for the Arts. She lives in Brooklyn. Welcome, Hannah. Thanks so much, Jordan. Uh, very excited to kick off the evening. I'll be reading four poems. Winter Pracy. I was a tourist for a night in a high rise by the water, tampons stuffed in my coat pockets, toothbrush mildewing inside a reused Ziploc. Early March, but warm enough to walk along the pier, to walk forward and then backwards, dragging my hand across the sagging flagstone and peering into other people's apartments. Each window was a square of light a diorama of a life. 
an unmade bed, tulips dying in a vase, a black thong flung atop an ottoman. It seemed the walls were ad hoc, temporary, flimsy frames the actors paced, confined within their chosen scenes. Strange to choose to be a silhouette, to jostle like a puppet on a stage, on a page ripped from a book of children's games. Marbles was a game I played, crouched on the black top, dirtying my skirt, my shooter a cat's eye shot with shards of icy blue. The perfect circle drawn in chalk, could it circumscribe them now, dear agitated creatures? Virtual reality. They've done a wonderful job with the sky, how the clouds move across it like paper cutouts. And the lilies are a nice touch, whoever was in charge of those. Come look at this Queen, Lan Queen Anne's lace, all those fine white florets that must have taken ages to get right. And they even managed to work out the green, that delicate translucent green where the sun shines through the leaves. The goldfinches are especially convincing. I'm glad they kept that bit the way the smallest birds fly with all that dip and thrust. What do we think they're testing here? Social media, climate change, capitalism? At least they didn't skimp on the graphics. Who knew God was an anthropologist all this time or a team of anthropologists with a very powerful computer and a dispassionate interest in the rise and fall of past civilizations? How do we think this simulation will end? No need to answer now. In the meantime, let's take the train downtown to that little Greek cafe we used to love. How generous that they even gave us trains. The trains could be better, but at least it's believable that they never run on time. And the people, this woman sitting on the bench across from us, I want to lean over and touch her skin. She's chewing gum with her eyes closed, the muscle moving in her jaw. I could tell you about it, but you're here too. You know it's true. Virtual meaning almost or nearly as described. A garden. The flowers are without reason, without economy or moderation. Pink and gold, they tower above the double doors. A citadel of silk, impervious to logic. They glow against the dark of December, despite rain, despite deprivation and mortality, as if an entrance to some other winter, some world in which the stream of time runs slant or in reverse. Though what they form is only a portico, preface to the fertility clinic on Fifth Avenue, where I admit I have wondered what one might learn about time, flesh, fate. Next door, mannequins pose in lace chemises, faces anonymous, feet helplessly arched. An uncomplicated argument on this Sunday morning, gray as mist itself and sodden with desire. Desire made visible and therefore endless, unpreventable. Against the wind, I've closed my coat, though my face keeps showing itself to the world, a face it seems that anyone could read. And the last poem I'll be reading is Devotion. I could never tell what the figures were holding in the antique lamp beside my mother's bed. One might be forgiven for thinking them deliberately inscrutable, their faces pinched in ecstasy or anguish, hands beating the air or clasped in supplication. All storylines are credible. Still, the figures beckon. Their fate is fixed. They cannot stop. If they did, they might hear voices like far off music but they cannot imagine what music is. Their world is silent, 
smooth as glaze. Sound washes over it like water polishing a stone. They have no knowledge beyond the surface of the lamp, which is continuous and therefore never ending. Only the incandescent bulb above them, like a terrifying sun, tells if it is night or day. At night, the sky floods with light. Thank you so much. Hannah, thank you so much. I keep, I'm gonna be thinking about all storylines are credible for so long. Um, that was amazing. Thank you so much for starting us off with such beautiful poetry. Um, and next we have Candace Jane Opper, who is a writer, a mother, and a visual artist. Her writing has appeared in Guernica, Long Reads, Narratively, Literary Hub, Brevity, Creative Nonfiction, Bright Wall, Dark Room, and Vestige, among others. She is the author of Certain and Impossible Events, selected by Cheryl Strayed for a Core Press Memoir Award. She grew up in the woods of Southern Connecticut and now lives in Pittsburgh with her husband and son. Welcome, Candace. Thank you so much, Jordan. <clears throat> um, just a quick content warning. I will be talking about suicide in this reading. Um, my book is very much about it, so it's hard to avoid. Um, but just a heads up. <clears throat> I first came across teen suicide in the movie Heathers, which I saw at the Cineplex with my older brothers when I was nine. Heathers is a dark comedy about a Bonnie and Clyde-esque teenage couple, JD and Veronica, who murder several of their classmates and disguise the murders as suicides. It's the kind of movie that would not fly now for its bad taste and potential for negative influence, but lives on as a cult classic for its shrewd critique of the cliques that dominate high school. As a kid, I probably didn't even notice the role of suicide in the plot. Teen suicide was a trope back then. Woe is me. The movie's only actual suicide, which I didn't pick up on until much later, happens at the end when JD detonates the bomb strapped to his chest but he was offered to us as a sociopath, so that wasn't supposed to count. The movie, of course, is much smarter than I then realized, a wry commentary on the systematic hysteria around teen suicide in the 1980s. While the school administrators react with bureaucratic disinterest, smoking cigarettes and discussing protocol around a conference table, the student body jumps at the opportunity to apotheosize their dead classmates, whose presumed suicides immeasurably increase their popularity post-mortem. Everybody's sad, but it's a weird kind of sad, Veronica writes in her journal. Suicide gave Heather depth, Kurt a soul, Ram a brain. I don't know what it's given me. This perhaps captures the essence of teen suicide, our rush to assign such deaths a meaning for the purpose of resolving both their absurdity and our sudden relative smallness. Teen suicide has always been a thing, but it wasn't recognized as a social issue until the 1980s a disillusioned time for the American teenager, or maybe the badness of being a teenager had finally come to the surface. Adolescent suicide clusters spotted the continent the way street lamps crowd together from the windows of a plane. Five in Westchester, New York, five in Arlington, Texas, another eight in Plano. The adolescent suicide rate tripled, making self-inflicted the third leading cause of death among Americans between the ages of 10 and 19. Health organizations scrambled to figure out why so many teenagers were killing themselves, and systematic suicide prevention efforts popped up inside schools and communities across the country. The greatest fear was that one suicide within a community would trigger a series, readily spreading from one kid to the next with the speed and efficiency of mononucleosis. This era appears to have begun with a 17-month period in 19 when 28 teenagers ended their lives in Chicago's affluent North Shore suburbs. Having the nicest things and the best advantages is supposed to make you feel good, not suicidal, a writer commented in the Chicago, Chicago Tribune magazine a year later. What is the point of the American dream? She went on to describe the affected community as well-mannered, cerebral, always be tidied up cosmetically. Local therapists dubbed it the suicide belt for its penchant to breed depressed teenagers. As to why a suicide epidemic took to these suburbs, the article points to wealth, 
academic pressures, unrealistic expectations, a lack of the material trappings of success, an excess of the material trappings of success, the 20th century shift from rural to urban life, the collapse of self-esteem, working mothers, insensitive mothers, neglectful mothers, and the hippies' failure to live up to their ideals and make the world a better place. The world didn't change and most of the hippies have been absorbed into the mainstream, the writer concluded, making it appear to today's teens that any type of alternative lifestyle is truly unattainable. We became teenagers in the early 1990s, at which point a class simply called health formally warned us of the dangers of teen suicide, but we didn't call it teen suicide. We called it blowing your brains out or slitting your wrists or ODing on something from inside your parents' mirror cabinet. And anyway, it only happened on TV. The odds of it occurring in real life were on par with one of us getting chosen to perform on Star Search. The health instructor presented a film strip on the subject, but it lacked the candor and gravity harnessed for teen pregnancy, drug abuse, or worse, HIV AIDS. Between the mid 80s and early 90s, adolescent HIV diagnoses quadrupled while suicide rates for the same age group plateaued. The HIV crisis frightened us because it reproduced actually. We had watched it creep in from what we thought of as the margins, from Africa to America, from the gay community to the hemophiliacs, from drug addicts to their friends, to their friend of friends of friends who could very well be us. I remember a video about a boy who acquired HIV from becoming blood brothers with another boy. I couldn't recall knowing a single person who had ever performed that ritual, but my inability to, to relate didn't seem to matter in the era of Ryan White, a boy not unlike us who had become a victim of the scariest epidemic of our lifetimes after being the recipient of an infected blood transfusion. Ryan was handed to us as an example. If it happened to him, it could happen to any of us. There is no Ryan White of teen suicide because there is no singular cause toward which we direct the force of our grief and astonishment. In a way, it feels absurd to compare HIV to suicide, a contagious outside force versus a non-communicable internal battle. Perhaps that is why suicide seemed less threatening at the time. It could not be acquired. It began inside a person. There seemed to be no way to avoid it beginning, only ways to notice it had already begun. And the noticing was presented to us as our responsibility. We were given the warning signs and asked to come forward should we detect any of them, a huge obligation for 12 and 13 year olds for whom overreacting was risky business. No one wanted to be the kid who told an adult that another kid was acting unusual or depressed, qualities that described most of us on any given day. The buzzwords associated with HIV were far more tangible, sperm, blood, condoms, needles. The related risky behavior was of a much more straightforward nature. The threat of suicide was too blurry, too elusive. It was barely on our radar. We were more scared of rejection, embarrassment, the threat of our true selves being revealed. When it finally happened, we were surprised and not surprised. Health class and made for TV movies and very special TV episodes had shown us that suicide was both preventable and inevitable. Each story had the same map. Teenagers who kill themselves equal their warning signs plus our obliviousness. We were taught to spot the signs, but always in retrospect, always after it was too late. The suicide narrative we saw over and over was that of missed premonitions, so much so that missed premonitions became one of suicide's necessary variables. Sure, each one could have been stopped, but they also all made sense in the end, given our propensity to overlook the obvious. When you died, we immediately busied ourselves putting all the pieces together, precisely how we were instructed to do. In little time, you became an abstract configuration of warning signs, an emblem of our insensitivity, a sacrifice to the health class gods, I assume it was not your intention to become an example, although without you present to defend your motives, an example is exactly what you became. When 14 year old boys kill themselves, the banal assumption is that they want something, attention, reverence, idolization, and believe suicide is the way to get it. Of course, boys who end their lives are not around to savor whatever posthumous attention they think they might receive. He didn't realize the consequences of his actions. I hear myself say about you often. This is at least partly true. Teenagers' misguided feelings of immortality are the result of their frontal lobes having not yet completed the process of neuronal myelination. Once they are fully myelinated, a process that can take males up to age 30, frontal lobes forecast the ramifications of 
explain your rather extreme recklessness, but it will never explain what you'd hope to achieve. Popularity, infamy, revenge. Perhaps the mirage of your own glorious aftermath was enough to blur any sense of caution that may have crept into your peripherals. Or perhaps you hadn't hoped to achieve anything. Maybe you were depressed or anxious or bipolar, now fairly standard diagnoses attached to adolescent suicide. Or maybe adolescence is a disorder of its own breed with the power to greatly handicap insight. When I was 14, I smoked a joint packed with oregano, helped a friend superglue her lips together and walked 10 miles to the beach in the middle of the night. Our histories are a collage of mistakes and close calls and subtle triumphs. One could argue you had the ultimate lapse in judgment, but on what scale are we measuring? Maybe the rest of us just got lucky. Thank you so much, Candace. I, I didn't work a super glue question into my Q&A, but I might have to, because I need to know how that ended. Um, so we may, we may go there after, but thank you so Love much. That. For that. Um, and up next, last but certainly not least, before we get to the Q&A is Nadia. Nadia Owusu is a Brooklyn-based writer and urban planner. Simon & Schuster published her first book, Aftershocks, a memoir on January 12th, 2021. Her lyric essay chapbook, So Devilish a Fire, won the Atlas Review Chapbook Contest. Her writing has appeared or is forthcoming in the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Lily, Orion, The Literary Review, The Paris Review Daily, Electric Literature, Catapult, Bon Appetit, Epiphany, and others. She is the recipient of a 2019 Whiting Award. Please welcome Nadia. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to read uh, a chapter from Aftershocks. It's called Day Four. I am the blue chair island. I rock and the island rocks. I pull at a blue thread on the chair's arm. I pull a hangnail from the third finger of my right hand. When I was a child, before I discovered my limitations when it comes to math and science and watching living things bleed, I thought I might want to be a surgeon as well as a writer. The earth, a pretty teacher once told me, is the universe in miniature. The body is a microscopic earth. If I mastered the body, I would know the earth. But I couldn't do that because I could barely comprehend algebra. I don't know what algebra has to do with anatomy exactly, but I suppose that proves my point. When I was 10 or so, I looked through my stepmother Annabelle's sister's textbooks from her medical school days. The pages were covered in numbers and diagrams and equations. There had to be, I hoped, another way to know the earth. I worried I would not discover one. In graduate school, I studied cities because I wanted to understand how places work, how I might live inside of them, how they might live inside of me. In my studio classes, we drew intricate maps on computers. They showed who lived where and how. On top of those maps, we drew other maps that imagined how we would build the city differently. I chose my graduate school program because it was concerned with how we can make people and communities healthier and happier through the built environment. Other programs were concerned with buildings for building's sake or for money's sake. We drew maps with more green space, more affordable housing, a lake, better schools, fewer cars, light rail, grocery stores that sold tomatoes that burst with juice when you cut them instead of chips that left your fingers greasy, instead of stale powdered donuts in plastic packaging. I imagined people I knew living in my cities. Their skin glowed and their lungs filled with fresh air that smelled like spring. They smiled at one another and at me. I was fascinated by place because no place had ever belonged to me, nor had I ever belonged to any place. That was also why, as a child, I was fascinated by the body. Perhaps I thought I could belong inside my own body. Perhaps I could know the streams of the veins in my wrists the way other people knew the streams in which they swam as children. Perhaps I could know the names of the bones in the back of my hand the way other people knew the names of the back roads that were shortcuts home. I could know the rhythm of my pulse, like my friend Dan knew the rhythm of the approaching train in his hometown the rhythm he woke up to and went to sleep to and hoped would lead him somewhere else someday. I never did get to know my body that way. What will happen, I wonder now, if I cut myself open? I once dissected a fetal pig. I laughed at its cold, rubbery corpse. 
I laughed as I made the first incision. I don't know why I laughed. I snatched small scissors from my desk and pressed the point of them into my thigh. I cannot bring myself to go deep. I do not laugh. The earth is reduced to this blue chair island. I rub the soil of my cheek against the soil of the blue upholstery. Once, I was in an airport somewhere in Africa, waiting for my father to arrive. It could have been Uganda, Ethiopia, or Tanzania. The memory is not a clear one. I so often waited for my father at airports. This airport had big windows that looked out on the landing strip so you could watch people get off the plane with their suitcases, cardboard boxes, and plastic bags. Nobody traveling to anywhere in Africa travels light. Tourists carry giant backpacks full of tents and mosquito repellent and absurd khaki outfits. Africans carry gifts for everyone they know and some for strangers. At the airport, there were no arrival gates. People walked down a ladder and onto the tarmac. They paused and set their luggage down. They took off their sweaters or wiped their glasses. I scanned the crowd for my father, but my eyes landed on a woman with brown skin like mine. She had long cornrows down her back. Her pause was longer than everyone else's. I wondered what she was doing. She got down on her knees and placed her cheek against the tarmac, then kissed it. She stayed there with her lips pressed to the ground for a good long time. What's she doing? I asked my stepmother, who was waiting beside me, examining her lipstick in the little mirror on its case. Greeting the earth, Annabelle said, as though it was the most obvious thing in the world. She's probably been away from home for a long time. With my cheek against the blue chair, I press my lips against the place in my wrist where my heartbeat whispers. Hello, I say. Up close, blue veins look like rivers trapped underground, borders not yet burst. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I feel like we've gotten such beautiful, tiny universes of the body, the mind, identity. Um, just thank you so much for that. And with that, um, everybody get excited. It is time to think about your questions. I have many to start us off. Um, so I will have questions for all three of you. This first one to kick us off, um, I've been thinking about this a lot with certain and impossible events and aftershocks. So question for Candace and Nadia, um, if you may, how did each of you go about retracing your steps and in some cases genuinely fact checking in order to compile and weave together these really powerful narrative accounts? It's a big question. But. Um, all right, I'll jump in. Um, well, I definitely kept some diaries and documents from the era that this happened in. So I did have like primary sources of my own. Um, and, but when I was going, when I was actually sort of diving into research, since there was very little documentation about this um, individual's suicide, which was a boy I knew in middle school, um, I, part of my research was that I ended up going back and sort of cold calling lots of people I went to middle school with um, to ask what they remembered. And this was close to 20 years after the fact. So there was, there was a lot of, uh, that was a really fascinating process because a lot of people, I was, really, I was really interested by the fact that a lot of people remembered the same exact things correctly. And a lot of people remembered other things completely differently. And, and I think that was, part of the nature of this book and, and the writing of it was the fact that like our memories change so much over time, especially like when we're thinking about traumatic events where you might remember very specifically like one random detail, like what, what phone you were using when you got this call about this event, but that bigger um, facts around it get blurred and change and sort of like the game of telephone, like they kind of change shape over time and you'll start to believe that something that, or you're like absolutely sure something is true, but it turns out that it's not true. And so that was a really fascinating process. I mean, there's, there's definitely a lot of facts around this that I just never had and won't have access to. So it was also about sort of writing around those, those negative spaces. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, very similarly, I, I did have some sort of journals and notebooks from some of the some of the periods that I was writing from. But I also have a sister. And um, for much of our lives, we've talked about our memories um, together, told stories. And I'm sure that those stories, you know, as Candace was saying, have taken on color and changed with time. And I sort of allow for that in the writing of the book as well. Um, I actually have an author's note in the beginning of the book that says, you know, this is my version. Um, there are the facts of the story and I don't want to take away from facts because we live in a in a kind of post fact uh, world in many ways right now but then there's the way that we experience them and there's there's the what we remember of those uh, facts and like how they feel in the body um, how how they felt in the mind and how we connected to them and so my author's note speaks to the fact that this is my version um, but that doesn't mean that I don't also believe other people's versions and um, I acknowledge um, many times in the book that someone else remembers an event differently or that we have a different point of view about the meaning of an event um, but I did talk to you know I talked to my family and I tried to sort of fit a lot of their perspectives into the story as well um, and and then sort of just like leaned into um, whatever visceral kind of memories I had of the smell and sound and touch and taste of the things around me and tried to capture as much of that as possible but then my book is also sort of a cultural history as well as a memoir so from those vivid events I then expand outward, you know, to bigger forces that shaped my life. My mother's family were descending from um, Armenian genocide survivors, and I'm exploring sort of the colonization of Ghana and the Ashanti kingdom where my father came from. And so I usually, in each chapter, kind of start with a very, very vivid memory and then allow that to open up into sort of what history I carried in my body and others carried in their bodies into that moment. Um, as well. And that allowed me to do a sort of a lot of kind of more academic research to kind of more deeply understand those histories, but also get kind of oral histories from people in my life and the elders in my family as well. I love that. Those are hugely great answers. They actually bring me to another question I had been thinking about, and this is for all three of you, Hannah included. Um, what advice might the three of you give someone who is, you know, writing their story, writing their narrative, but um, is so intrinsically linked to other people, whether it is classmate, family, partner, whoever, you know, just to navigate those politics and be true to your story while being perhaps sensitive or sympathetic to, you know, other people involved in the storytelling. Um, I can start on this one. So um, I actually started writing Aftershocks kind of as a private project just for myself. I was trying to write myself to kind of deeper root rootedness. Um, my father worked for the UN. I think that's kind of touched on in the excerpt that I read, which meant that we moved to a different country every couple of years. Um, it also meant that I grew up outside of my parents' cultures, with my father being Ghanaian, my mother Armenian-American, and my mother left when I was two. And so I was especially um, disconnected to her culture and her family. And there came a time in my life where I felt like um, an answer, not not the answer, not that it would solve everything, but an answer to sort of the grief that I was carrying um, around all of those losses of the places that I left behind and the families that I never got to know deeply was to sort of explore the histories and cultures of those places and people and to connect to them in deeper ways. And so I was doing this just for myself, but I held as a principle, I didn't think I was going to publish it until much later. I was actually working on a novel that I thought that's what I was going to publish and this was sort of something I was doing for myself. But because of that in part, um, I set principles for myself that like what I was writing toward was deeper connection, understanding, um, compassion and love for the people and places in my life. And so holding on to that principle meant that nobody could be a villain in my story. I had to like examine the complications of everyone in my life. And you know, that didn't mean that I wasn't going to write about the difficult things. But it did mean that um, I had to allow everyone kind of the fullness of their humanity as much as I allowed myself um, on the page. And that was a principle that I held in writing about other people. That's lovely. Candice, do you want to speak next or should I? You should go for it. You haven't you haven't spoken yet, so you should take a turn. 
quite all right, but <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I mean, that's so beautiful, Nadia, what you said about um, affording everyone their full humanity um, on the page. And yeah, I think, I mean, it's a really difficult question. I think poets especially often um, get themselves into situations of <laughs> divulging potentially sensitive information um, about other people. Um, and, you know, even when I was preparing um, for the reading tonight, I was going through some of my poems and, you know, some of my poems do have, um, you know, they, they feature people, real people in my life and, um, you know, things that, things that have been said and <laughs> there's, yeah, there's a question of, um, uh, yeah, what you feel comfortable sharing and um, what other people are comfortable with. And I mean, for the poems in question, you know, it was nothing, I would say nothing um, too, too sensitive, but I still, you know, I would have wanted to be able to ask permission before, um, you know, the, the poem hasn't been published yet. Um, so I would, I would ask permission, I think, before sharing it. Um, but um, that's, yeah, that's kind of the, the only wisdom I have to offer is um, like, yeah, I think, you know, go, go with your gut in terms of, um, you know, what, um, what is going to be sensitive and, and what people will be comfortable with. I love that. I think go with your gut is always very nice advice. Candace? Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I feel like very easy answer to this question would be that I ultimately changed names in my book, um, which was, you know, I did connect with the boy's family um, during the process of researching and writing the book. And, um, you know, they, that was just something they explicitly asked me to do. And I was absolutely fine with that. And so, um, you know, that was, that was one sort of easy route to that. Also, I, this is a, an event that happened so long ago that um, it's almost like there's like a literary statute of limitations or something on, on it. Like, you know, um, what, you know, in terms, especially like when, when uh, I'm not using actual names, but um, a harder answer I think is that a theme that came up a lot in my book was like, who has the right to tell what stories? Um, specifically because I was writing about someone that I didn't really know very well. And I was writing my story of my own personal experience with his death, but also writing his story, um, which he never had an opportunity to tell. So I think that I struggled a long time with, um, like, do I write to tell this person's story um, or make an attempt at that? Um, do I have a right to grieve this person to the degree that I feel like I am? I, I think that there, there's sort of like a hierarchy to grief and like there's like an inner circle and an outer circle and I definitely am in the outer circle. And I felt like most, many of the books I was reading about grief and loss were written from the perspective of people who were very close to the loss. And um, so I think something just like shifted in me where I felt a little bit like, well, maybe, I'm presenting a perspective that needs to be out there since it's there, there, it's like not represented. And I think other people have had similar experiences where they're deeply affected by people um, in different ways that they may not know very well. And I think that's a valid experience. And like, you know, it just took me a while to get to that point. So once I got to that point, it's it's sort of like navigating the sensitivity of of people who are actually like in the inner circle and how do you you know go with your gut obviously is a great way to talk about it but I think um you know specifically sort of working with people in any way that you can to kind of navigate that with them that's great thank thank all three of you for that very thoughtful answer I think we have a, re a related question in the chat um, I really like this so and I I don't know which one of you it was because I feel like it actually applies to both of you um, Candace and Nadia, you talk about carrying memories. Have you read The Body Keeps the Score? And can you say more about carrying memories and how that emotion comes forth in your writing? And I imagine that for me, that applies to all three of you. So whoever would like to answer that. 
no pressure. I think that was Nadia, so, right? So maybe you should go first. <laughs> sure, sure, I can start. Um, I have read The Body Keeps the Score. I read a lot about sort of epigenetic inheritance, grief and trauma and the way that we carry them in our body as I was writing um, as part of my private project. And I was particularly interested because I, there's genocide in my family and that's actually how my family came to America and it's why I'm American. So that's like one way that you carry that inheritance is like what your ancestors carried with you or couldn't carry with carry with them or couldn't carry with them um, as they sort of escaped in in this case genocide um, but but so I I kind of mean it in a lot of senses I think there are ways that in the body there are like ancient tensions that um, you inherit and that sort of um, trigger your kind of fight or flight in ways that you don't fully understand and particularly if you're not sort of exploring your own personal grief and trauma um, there are ways that the body holds on to that. But then my father is also from the Ashanti tribe of Ghana. And so another way that I think about it that is like um, kind of a celebration is that um, Ashanti people believe that our ancestors are actually always present with us. We pour libation to our ancestors and we believe that they sort of interfere with our lives um, in ways both good and bad. Um, and, and so I'm also talking about that in terms of the ways in which history is always present. And, you know, in, in Ghana, there is a sense that we are the history that we're made of. It's a very collectivist um, society. And so connecting to sort of the oral storytelling traditions of Ghana is another way that I uh, connect to this collective memory of my family and bring it into sort of my worldview and how I understand the world, even as I've largely been ed educated in sort of the Western world. Um, but yeah, so I mean it in a lot of ways, I think, there are so many ways that we carry um, histories and carry our ancestors and families and our bodies as we move through the world and some that we notice in some ways that we uh, don't know and that are kind of mysterious to us. That's great, thank you. Uh, and, and no pressure, if Candace or Hannah, if you do want to respond to this, you're welcome to. I don't wanna put everybody on the spot all the time, but just in case you are jumping at this chance, let me know. Um. I don't know if I'm jumping at the chance, but I, like, <laughs> I can have a, a quick response. It's uh, that's a hard act to follow since Nadia actually uh, was the one who talked about carrying memories. But I, um, yeah, I'm notoriously a person who like wears all of my shit on my sleeve, and so I think that like I, I just I aggressively talk about things all the time, and and. Um, I think that I think of grief often as like a physical thing. Like uh, almost, the image I often think of in my mind is that like if you land and with a parachute and the parachute is attached to you and you just like walk around your life with this parachute like dragging behind you, like that's sort of how I think of my grief as like this physical thing that's like with me at all times. And um the speech is that at some point in like a you know about halfway between this uh, loss happening and this book coming out I got this person's name tattooed on my body with the years that they lived and died and it was like a way I think in my mind when I did it I was thinking of it as like this form like some sort of symbolic closure but I think actually what the tattoo symbolized was like another route to keep the conversation open because you know I have a number of tattoos and I should know that having a tattoo is a way to sort of like it is a form of like conversation with the world because it's a visible thing on your body in many cases that people can see and ask you about so that like getting a tattoo of someone's name and their the, the year they were born and the year they died is like a way to continue this conversation, you know, like to keep the conversation going on and on. And I think that's just how I aggressively sort of like have my memories just out in the open all the time. I love that aggressive, aggressive memory carrying, honestly. I think that's great. Um, Hannah, did you want to respond to this? Do you want to wait for my next question? Very kind of you, Jordan, to include me. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, you both answered so beautifully. Um, I don't feel that there's um, too much I can add. I, I, I can't say that my work, you know, specifically is 
talking or thinking about memory in maybe the same way yours is. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of poetry also is very much steeped in memory. Um, Rilke said, you know, the two uh, never ending wells of inspiration for poets are dreams and childhood. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I think me memory is so incredibly powerful and, you know, I remember reading once that every time we remember something, that memory is actually being rewritten in our minds. Um, and so I think, I think for poets, a lot of the work is um, trying to do that act of translation of um, translating the power of that memory into, into some kind of language. That's beautiful. You all, I hope everybody out there is taking notes or is going to rewatch this later on McNally Jackson's YouTube channel because there is wisdom being shared here tonight. Um, that said, there is a question in the chat about um, links for the books for readers. Yes, if you scroll up in the chat, you will find those links and or someone can be kind enough to copy and paste as I move on to our next question. But please scroll up and buy these books or you can find the information on the event page for tonight. Um, excellent. I think my next question for all of you, um, and this is a very poety question of me, but I think it applies across the board, is for each of you, no matter the project, is there a question or a series of questions maybe that you're writing to answer or writing to explore? You know, for I, I ask that because for me, there's usually one guiding question I have that informs many projects, and I'm always curious about if there is kind of that North Star for you, no matter the project. And the answer could just be no. It could be like, I had an idea and that was that was it. And I wrote the idea, Jordan. No. Um, I can I can start. Um, yes, I do. I do usually um, have questions that I'm sort of writing toward. I, I am a writer like many who writes to understand. I think it was um, Joan Didion who said that she writes to understand what she thinks. Um, and I, I definitely feel that way. I'm, I'm always sort of like writing towards a curiosity um, that I'm that I'm holding and trying to figure out what it means and what I think and um, usually then that sort of presents additional questions that I can um, explore in my next project. You know, the deeper you go, the more questions that come out of it. And so my next project um, is, is sort of a question that is explored in Aftershocks, but I kind of am opening it up in a different way and looking at it from a different angle. So yeah, I, I feel similarly to you, Jordan. I love that, that's great. I don't know if I can say I have a singular question that guides all of my writing. I think maybe part of that is because I've been working on this one project for so long and I've, you know, I've done another, a, a lot of other writing, but it's, this is the only like large project I've ever worked on. But um, I think generally what guides a lot of my work is that I am someone who is very, very influenced by like cinema and pop culture growing up. And I think that what I think about a lot is like the space between my personal history and the cultural history in which I was like engaged with most of the time, which for me personally was a lot of movies and television <laughs> in the 1980s. And so like, I, f I feel like I'm constantly trying to find this line between like my understanding of reality and my understanding of like a fictional sort of reality that exists like somewhere else in my brain um that is these like many many like cinematic universes you know it's like there's like this murky space between my personal history and like sort of pop cultural history and i'm trying to like always find where that line lands and where things are bleeding in between because i think that I was so deeply influenced by so much of that and it, it influences how I think and how I write. So I'm always trying to like pare things down and find where that, that divide is. I exactly love that kind of murk and we will talk about Heather's another time for sure. Um, so that is wonderful, thank you. And Hannah. Um, yeah, that's such a great question, Jordan. I feel like I should have a better answer to it. Um, but I guess a, a lot of my 
work is guided um, just by language. Um, a lot of the poems, I would say, start with a, a fragment of language, something that um, has, has a sort of music to it. Um, and that's kind of like the, the seed crystal um, that gets things started. Um, and then I would say the other um, kind of organizing principle is just this act of noticing, um, which I think, you know, I've, I've been thinking, I was, I was reading about, um, you know, stand up comics and like, <laughs> I was thinking, wow, like, you know, this process is actually, um, very similar, you know, they notice something interesting um, and then they want to take that and make something from it. Um, and I think that's a similar kind of impulse in my writing is, um, yeah, notice just, just noticing just like that's funny or that's interesting or that's strange or I, I want to look deeper into this. Um, and that's, that's usually how it starts. I love that so much. That's a fantastic answer. I, I love the idea of poet as stand-up comic. Honestly, I think there is a lot in common. There's the humor tragedy component we all have here tonight, honestly. Absolutely. Um, that's wonderful. We probably only have time for one more question. Um, so this one, and this is a, a question of books, but I think Hannah, for you in this time as well, depending on what you're working on, um, I wondered, you know, especially with releasing these two books, these topics, um, with the pandemic, with everything being virtual, what the biggest challenges have been with releasing these books out right now, but also maybe the biggest good surprises, um, something you are excited about for the future or that you didn't know would get you excited? And Hannah, if that pertains to something bigger you might be working on, I was just curious. All my questions are like three parters. So you can always take one part and just run with it if you want. Nadia, you can go. Um, <laughs> you go. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's been, it's been a total whirlwind and um, it's been, I don't know, just so much work, but I feel like it has like really pushed me to think outside the box in terms of like how to engage with people um, because, you know, I'm, uh, even though I feel like I'm missing this kind of, you know, this is my first book and I was always looking forward to this sort of like rite of passage of like having your big book release and, and um, you know, being able to like go on a little book tour to different cities and things like that. And I'm obviously like miss that opportunity to be traveling and, and meeting new people. But I also, it's been a really great opportunity for me to do some more visual art um, related to my book. And I, I sort of unexpectedly got a little grant to produce a, a zine last summer. And so I started this zine series that I have been thinking about for a while that's all centered around archives. And so I ended up producing a second one that's related to my book and personal archives that, that I talk about in the book. And so being able to do virtual events allows me to like share some of those visuals as kind of like a slideshow. And, and that's an opportunity that I wouldn't traditionally have if I were on a book tour. And so it's, I feel like it's, it's challenging me in really different ways to think about like how, how can a book, how can people engage with a book and the content of a book in a different way besides a traditional like reading in a bookstore? Like how can I think outside that box? So that's been a really great sort of um, aspect that I was not expecting. That's wonderful. I do want to hear from others, but real quick, someone is asking if you have an answer for this already, what that zine might be oh, called. I, um, it's called Ditto. This is um, the cover of the one that's related to my book. And I can share a link in the chat of where you can pick it up too. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you. Um, sure, I mean, I think I think for me, the something that has been sort of challenging is um, is sort of the 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 fact that we're not able to kind of be in person together and sort of connecting with people 
um, one on one and sort of engaging in that way. But on the other hand, um, my book is in many ways about sort of longing um, across great distances, whether geographic or cultural, you know, in terms of my, my own family linguistic. And so in some ways, the themes of the book really kind of speak to this moment um, in, in interesting ways. And so the conversations that I have had um, around the book, um, I feel like people are sort of looking to dig into these questions that I'm sort of wrestling with in the book um, in, in very interesting ways um, that sort of speak to the current moment as well as to the kind of specificity of my own story. And then another fun thing has just been that because my family is all over the world, this virtual um, space has meant that um, family members have been able to join from wherever they are. You know, I had an aunt join from Singapore and I had um, a cousin join from the UK. And so that's been nice too, to be able to have my family kind of in the space. That's wonderful. I love that. And I know, Hannah, the question was, you know, big on books, but depending on what you're working on, if there is a bigger project in the work, um, if there are surprises right now or good surprises about being in this virtual space or or bad surprises yeah definitely um yeah i was gonna echo what um nadia had said about being in touch with family um the interesting thing about the pandemic is it's kind of made distance binary it's like you're either with someone or you're not with someone but if you're not with them that person could be like thousands of miles away or they could be, you know, two miles away. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been nice, I would say, to reconnect with people um, that I normally wouldn't uh, be connected with. Um, oh, I love that. Um, oh, I think I might have oh, just, been just been echoing. Yeah, that sound a little, okay. a little echo. Yeah, sound a little echo. Little echo what the... Okay, maybe, maybe it's better now. We'll see. I have, okay, we have one more question. This is a quick one. So I hope you guys will forgive me that we're gonna be like a minute over. Last question for all quickly in the chat. Favorite or must have beverage or food while writing? I like this one, we end on a high. Coffee. Yeah. Easy. Yeah, I'm gonna be boring and say coffee too. <laughs> um, this is my friend. Hi, Josh. Um, <laughs> I, I have to be honest that I like pound TikToks. I mean, that's sort of my TikToks are, are kind of like my version of chain smoking, which is terrible. And my dentist would kill me if they heard this, but I just, especially when I'm really focused, I just sort of like eat TikToks one after the other. It's really creepy. Fresh mints right now, the, the, the whitey ones. <laughs> I love this so much. These feel like very trendy writer answers with coffee and Tic Tacs. This is it. Well, thank you all so much for being here. I really enjoyed this. I so appreciate your beautiful writing and your thoughtful answers to these questions. Um, and I just want to thank Maris and McNally Jackson again so much for this. You can find us at pigeonpagesnyc.com and enter our poetry contest, which closes on Friday. Do not miss it. Thank you again to our readers. This is wonderful. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Maris. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.